the way, I want to thank uh, Cinnabar is wonderful. I wish it would come to Hollywood, but... <laughs> I mean, what's better? I mean, you can eat and drink with great community of people at the same time to enjoy a movie. There's nothing like it. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, and thank you, Seattle. What a great place. I, I, if my work and family weren't in Hollywood, I'd probably rather live here than there. Uh -huh. a little bit about the genesis of this film. I don't think a lot of people realize that it was actually spawned by the cabaret act that you and your younger brother Danny did back in the 1970s. It would call so much a, a cabaret act as a musical performance ensemble called the Mystic Knights the Oingo Boingo. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, this was kind of like my live show, and we were kind of changing into a rock group. So I wanted to record on film what I'd been doing on stage, and Forbidden Zone is pretty much that, but this is what our live stage shows look like. Uh. <laughs> so, but, it was up, but it fell up to you to sort of like pull together a, 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 a linear story. <laughs> to sort of string the, uh, the musical on numbers together, right? I don't know how linear it was. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why I, I paused. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about that. You were 19 years old. I'm going to go back in time a little bit. You were 19 years old, and you ran away to join the circus, so to speak. Well, it was really the, the Grand Magic Circus. Uh -huh. was a French theater ensemble with some... Some odd sound going on there. Like, uh, here in Seattle, it's rain. It's falling. <laughs> uh, so anyway, they had a show in Paris. They invited me, and then Peter Brook from the Royal Shakespeare Company took us under his wing and put us in an 800-seat place mm -hmm. and gave us a budget. It was a big hit. And the, the director, Jerome Savary, who was kind of my mentor, uh, became the director of the French National Theater. Mm -hmm. afterwards. And, and so, then uh, I brought my brother Danny the day he got out of high school over to join us and he did some of his first musical compositions. <laughs> <laughs> so you were, you, so how long did you spend in Paris doing this kind of um, experimental guerrilla theater? Well, it, it, three years. And, uh, but we, we toured Europe. We, we actually I mean, played even Eastern Europe. We, we got as far as Tehran. Tehran <laughs> which is pretty wild. Yeah. And then, um, and, and then you went, you came back. The, the shawl was going down, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he gave Peter Brook like an unlimited budget to do, uh, you know, like whatever. So Jerome Savory was clever. So you know, here were these like first class tickets with a red carpet, caviar, all included things. So he pumped up the the membership of our theater company, included a dozen top people from the French press. <laughs> so in downtown Tehran. Uh, okay, anyway. <laughs> the night you saw uh, the Cinnabar Sinful Marching Band, which we whooped up since 5 o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> so anyway, they asked me to do some sort of street manifestation with the theater company, and I had great players, great musicians. Uh, so it, it caused a riot in downtown Tehran. <laughs> uh, I mean, wonderful people, but those, those boys were pent up. And this is kind of like, like batons are cracking heads and it was scary. But uh, it, it filled our theater for the next year in Paris. Uh, I, 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 I diverge. Cold, you, yes. you did digress a little bit, but the blood is always good. It sells tickets. Anyway, so you came back to the States and, um, and came back to uh, Hollywood, right? Hollywood, yes. And decided to uh, put your, and sort of translate what you were doing in Paris on stage. Yeah, and that was the Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo. That's the, the Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo. So, the film is actually, the film is actually your, your efforts to sort of transcribe the, the, the stage pieces that you had been doing with your brother and, and the ensemble on the film. Yeah, I, I was leaving the group. The group was turning into eight-piece Oingo Boingo instead of 12-piece Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo. Which ultimately became the band that, you know, yeah. Trend, you know, rewrote a generation.
but um, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about um, the stage work and, and, and how that became the film. You, you, you told me that originally you started shooting the film in 16 millimeter. Yeah, I, I basically shot 60 minute, 16 millimeter film. Right. Some friends persuaded me to add 20 minutes, but let's shoot it in 35 and then blow up the 16. We've got a feature. Uh, I have stage background and not film background. And also, I had an amateur uh, DP director of photography on a 16mm film. But even though this was a cheap film with no budget, I had a very top, older DP, uh, Greg Sander, who shot in black and white. So his photography didn't match with the other photography, so I had to junk the 16, reshoot stuff, along with actors from the 16 that were real crazies that found off the street. They were great, but the problem with real crazies is that they're really crazy. <laughs> and like, don't show up and get in fights or get in hospitals. At least like that. So I, I had to replace them all with real actors, except for the heavy set kid that did Big Van Boom. <laughs> and he, the poor kid, I rehearsed the hell out of him, then when I put him in front of the camera, he froze up. Aww. Couldn't see his lips move. So I had Matthew Bright, who's to share baloney, squeeze at Henderson, do the part, and then I put his lips in. And then I had him move around a little bit, it was funny. And years and years. Oh, okay, one other thing, not only that, is that's when I show actors as an admonition to do the part the way I want it, or I'll fix them afterwards. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead and do it your way. Sure. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, I was going to say, um, for, uh, for years and years, I thought that actually Richard was paying tribute to an old um, post pre 1960s television show called Clutch Cargo. Does anybody remember the show? Yeah. All right. Where it was still frame animation and they just animated live moving lips over the image. I've never seen it. Yeah, see, I said it's too clip. You never heard of it before. <laughs> and, I, and, and here I had, I had, I, you know, I had heard this uh, credit to this where it was not due, so forgive me. So, um, so let's talk a little bit about the casting of the film, Richard. When you when you came to uh, putting people together for this film, um, Susan Tyrell, Hervé Villachez, um how did you get these people to do this film? Um, it was kind of again fortuitous. <laughs> uh, Matthew Bright, the guy who played Squeeze it and Renee, under the name Tashira Baloney. Uh, well, by the way, he went on to write a film called Gun Crazy, which broke Drew Barrymore as an adult. Then he wrote and directed Freeway, which broke Reese Witherspoon as an adult. So he's a very talented writer-director. But he went to school with Danny. And Danny and I went to different high schools uh, on different sides of the tracks. <laughs> But the, the dirty little secret is oh, that... Oh, oh, wait, wait, okay, so Matthew went to Danny's high school, and he was one of the original Mystic Knights. Okay, at the time we did this, Matthew's roommate was Hervé. Right. Hervé was screwing Susan. Nice. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> in, in, in the, the uh, window of time between you and I doing interviews and, and the screening, people have asked me, do you have any of that on film? Uh, <laughs> well, I, I mean, the, the love between them and the jealousy and the fighting was going on both on camera and off camera. <laughs> okay. So, um, so we, uh, so let's move on to, you originally shot it in black and white, and, um, and then, uh, but you actually, in your little hard parts, you wanted to do it in color. Or well, at least well, what my intention was, was the Forbidden Zone stuff, I wanted to send to China and have it hand-tinted. Right. A process they did in Paris in the 20s, kind of another thing. But it was utterly impractical, and I was out of cash long before the film was finished. So fortunately, about a year and a half ago, Legend Films, uh, they're the top colorists and 3D people in Hollywood, offered to colorize it. They spent three times more on the colorization than I spent on the shooting. <laughs> but they let me tweak the hell out of everything. I mean, to my heart's content. And there was a little stumbling block as far as the color of your brother's eyes were concerned. I, okay, I, I'm, sometimes males don't, I can't sometimes tell between the difference between dark blue and black or whatever, so I called his wife Bridget Fonda. 
<laughs> I said, what is the color of Danny's eyes? Because he didn't know. <laughs> so let's open it up to some questions from the audience. Um, 